that's to give you a nice um, a nice intro. I gotta I gotta manage saying things really loud right as soon as we go live so that if people are like oh what's this guy i like his haircut let's talk let's listen to what he has to say and then i start right at the gate by making a loud noise in your ear you're not going to keep watching so i gotta be the, the i finger bang you like that pow 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 um i know that sounded stupid what i just said i am aware this is the pre-show the five minutes prior to us kicking off the live show for real and so it's a little sillier it's a little stupider we are a little goofy, and I'm drinking coffee out of this Hedwig mug. Is this Hedwig? I think it is. Guys, I've not even read all the Harry Potter books, nor seen all the movies. I know. You don't like that. Me saying that has just blown apart your universe. Hey, quiet, you. I think Harry Potter is good, and it did not capture me enough to have me continue going with it. That being said, there's not a lot of fantasy fiction, as I think about it, in movies lately that have really gripped me. I tend to angle myself more towards sci-fi. I like science fiction a little more than fantasy fiction, generally. And um, growing up, I read a ton of, uh, like, my books were Wheel of Time. I used to really like A Song of Fire and Ice, which then later be got made into Game of Thrones. So I read that back, 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 back in the early days when I was looking for something outside of Wheel of Time to read. Um, if you haven't read Wheel of Time and you're looking for a fantastic series to get into, I highly recommend that. And even better, um, maybe not maybe not better, but like the series that's really gripped me most recently is a series called The King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, Rothfuss. Let me put that right here. The King, the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. Man, does that guy write good. Writes really beautiful sentences, beautiful statements. And some of my other big uh, go-to people are uh, Ted Chang, Ted, C-H-I-A-N-G, who writes almost entirely, um, I would call them uh, science fiction, uh, science fiction short stories. And, um, he wrote Arrival. That's what he's most well known for. I got to check. My friend just sent me a message and it might be that I'm not actually live. Am I not live? Why have you sent me a message, Nick? He's going to tell me. You guys have to tell me if my volume's not coming through or whatever's going on. I always get nervous. Is this actually sound coming through? Is this working? In any event, um, Ted Chang, I'm going to put right here, uh, Arrival was originally called The Story of Your Life. Oop, don't tag that person. Uh, whatever I'm using to capture audio, my friend Nick says, is bouncing the text around like crazy. Well, that's really weird. I'm not using anything. That would be uh, um, Facebook. But thanks for the heads up, Nick. Hey, Dave, nice to see you, man. Whoever's here, whoever these people are, just say hi. Put your name in, let me know where you're at, what you're doing, where do you live? What are you up to? How's Friday going for you? My, I, I found Ted Chang originally because um, he'd run, this was about 15 years ago, he'd won a short story uh, compilation and he'd written a story called Exhalation, which is this short story about these creatures. It's written from the first person. They're not humans. And it's this creature who um, they're like robotic in nature. And one of the creatures, oh man, Seneca's going to talk smack and leaf like a tree. It's nice to have you with us at the start, San. I always like that. One of these creatures devises a system where he can get his hands behind his head and then he sets up a series of mirrors so he can like oh, unscrew the back of his head to see what his brain looks like. And as he starts to do that, he talks about the process of going through it. And it's just a fascinating story. And the thing I love about Ted Chang is the guy cannot write a boring sentence. Every single sentence he writes is like, oh my God, this is so well written and beautifully said and ah, it's fascinating. And the other thing that I love about him is he his background is he's a technical writer. So he'd write documents for, you know, like the technical specifications of this iPhone here. By the way, cool case, right? Recognize that symbol right there? That's me. 
So super cool guy. If you're looking for something to read um, that doesn't take too long, got to check out Ted Chang. He's amazing. And if you liked the movie Arrival and the concept of circular time and stuff like that, he's got a ton of ideas like that. He's fantastic. What up, Lauren? Hello, Brooklyn. Hey, Kristen. What up, Sook? Sook, as some people like to call it, but they're wrong. Or maybe they're right and I'm wrong. I don't know. Let's set the coffee aside. We're coming into the start proper. We've got tiger mug to start us off today. That's a good shape mug. I like how it goes in like that. Um, before I, well, let's do the let's do the pouring of the tea so that this is all <laughs> above board. Let's not mess this up. So, we've got the mug, we've got the tea, the live pour. It's happening. How tall can we get it? Whoa, whoa! That's some tall pouring. I don't want to pour that all over my keyboard though. So let's just keep it on the level. Let's have that first sip, just primus sippus. Mm, that's good tea. Earl Grey, keep it simple guys. For me, it's Earl Grey with a bit of vanilla in there. Keep it simple, but let's let's be a little bit, a mm, little bit of a, a, a rebel. One of the books I'm really interested or into right now is this massive tome I'm gonna show you. Look at the size of that thing, it's huge. I could use that to break my way out of a building if I was ever trapped in it. So this gorgeous book is the history of information graphics. This graphic on the front, what this is showing is that's Mount Vesuvius. And these are, uh, the each color represents flows of lava over the years. It's hard to really tell because this is just the picture they've taken for the cover. But this sort of book, you can see just how huge it is. I love books like this, which are basically like archival books. So if you look at this thing, they've got this one's pilot chart of the North Atlantic Ocean. What else do we have? United States political history. You can see, you can trace here. Originally, it was the Whig Party, and then they split into the Federal Party and the Democratic Republican, and then this and that. What else do we have? There's like some Nazi propaganda in this book mountains. Here's a thing of France there on the one side. What's really cool about a book like this to me, hold on, let me just get this cover on nice. I don't want to wreck this beautiful cover. Normally I tear dust jackets off my books. I'm like, get out of here. But that's boring as a cover. I don't want that. So I want to get this just, there we are. Now we're talking. Ah, get that beautiful. Tashin, tell me about Tashin, Dave. I don't, I just saw you mention that and I'm not familiar with them. I just noticed on the cover. Is this a publisher? Give me some information. Anyhow, this is gorgeous. I love this sort of stuff. And I'm fascinated by things like the history of how we've used graphics to organize information for no reason other than it's interesting to me. I'm not reading this because I want to learn about how to make better infographics. I'm not reading this because I want to learn how to craft the best thing to communicate the thing to you that I want you to get from bubble. None of that. I don't care about any of that. I'm reading this because it's fascinating to me. And I find that when I angle my life towards what fascinates me, I get to live a fascinating life. So that's kind of cool. Hey, Sachko. Morning, Tommy. What is, uh, tell me what you have to do in grade five math. What are those kids doing these days with grade five math? Hey, Mara, nice to have you with us. Uh, Dave says, Tashin makes big, beautiful books, photography, art, images, and art history. Dolly's is always, oh, beautiful. I'm always looking for um, more books like this. I want to see if I have, I'll show you one other that's, am I going to be able to bring uh, No, I'm not. And it makes for bad TV if I just go over here to try to find it. Um, the other publisher that I really like is, uh, I think they're DK is the name of them. And they do a lot of um, Stephen Beasley is an author that as a kid, I got a book that he'd made called um, Amazing Cross Sections. And so he had one, the one my parents got for me for Christmas one year was um, a big, huge book that showed a whole bunch of cross sections of a man of war, like the, the battle boats, not the jellyfish. And what is so cool about Stephen Beasley and his approach and his art and all of this is that um, he, Okay, stop. I got to put myself in do not disturb mode. Uh, how do I do that? I don't know. I'm, oh, here it is. Uh, do not disturb. 
for one hour. There we go. What Stephen Beasley does is he shows these amazing, like a boat and like all of the decks. And he really brings a lot of the life that would have been happening at the time of this into the art. So it'll show like people rummaging around and here's a stowaway on the boat and here's what the chef is doing. And he also has all these cool little hidden things in there, kind of like a Where's Waldo book. So it's really a fun series of books and really beautiful to, to flip through. We've got one of them in our pub called Amazing Cross Sections. Wow, fractions at grade five. Huh, interesting. I guess that's what they're doing. I, don't, I didn't remember that. I don't really remember what, oh, I remember grade five. Grade four and grade five, what I can remember, I'll share this story and then we'll get into our topics, is that um, we would, my teacher, Mr. McDonald, who in hindsight, hey, Evan, might have had, well, definitely had some anger issues. He was not very responsible for his anger. I can remember him hurling chairs across the portable, you know, those little small classrooms that they fit on to expand the size of a school, hurling chairs across the portable. And I think he might have even went, put his fist through the wall. I, I can't really remember. Anyhow, I was on his good side, but he had some stuff. Yo, yo, Mia. But he uh one of the things we would do every friday was we had to we'd get a grid a nine by nine grid and you would draw you write in the numbers as he told you from one to nine and then you would do it down the other side and then you would have you'd be timed and you'd have to like answer you know nine and eight what's nine times eight 72. Seven and six 63 no 42 sorry <laughs> seven and nine is 63. anyhow you'd go through this and you had to like answer as quickly as you could you didn't have to do as fast as you wanted, but if you were the first one to answer all of them correctly, you got three butterscotch candies. He always had butterscotch candies. And so that's the part of fifth grade math I really remember is getting really good at my math tables to win those butterscotch candies. And it paid off because I, I earned them a lot and I know my math tables, notwithstanding that whole embarrassing debacle with uh, the number 63, seven times nine. Okay, well, Enough of this chit chat. Let's get to our topics here. Uh, where did I put them? There I put them. Thanks everyone in advance for everyone that provided a set of topics. We have some good ones and there's like a central theme to all of these. Um, so first let's, I think I'm gonna talk about, um, Hannah Floyd said her suggestion for a topic was learning to say no and withdraw from an agreement or contract. So like you've made an agreement, a promise, a commitment, learning to say no to that. And then she asked, what's your experience, Adam, with following your gut instinct and standing up to others around you who are saying yes? And while she didn't say this, I imagine that also means that are kind of pushing for your yes, that are kind of insisting or telling you you should be a yes or, you know, whatever that happens to be. So what what's my experience there following my gut instinct on that? So um, first I wanna talk about something interesting, or at least that I find interesting, which is about contract law. I promise this will get interesting or hopefully it will. So in contract law and law school, you your foundation for all of the laws that operate are you've got kind of three principles in private law, and then you've got some public law. Private law is law that governs my interaction between you and I, whereas public law would be laws that govern my interaction with the government, the public as a whole. So in public law, you have statutes and legislation and you have the criminal code. In private law, the three foundational pieces are property law, the laws that govern ownership of property and who owns what and how do we interact that way. Contract law, which is the law that governs agreements effectively and tort law. And tort law is the law that governs like harms caused by one individual to another and who bears the responsibility. If I have a flower pot on my uh, balcony and it a gust of wind blows it off and it lands on your head, the courts are looking at that interaction, we'll call it an interaction from the lens of like, okay, it's no one's fault that the wind blew, but like who has to bear the cost of this? This person's been harmed and now they're going to have to pay money. It's There's going to be some requirements that need to be met in order for this harm to be remedied. Who bears the responsibility for that? Is it the person walking below who should always look above to make sure they're safe? Is it the person that put the flower pot there that should be aware that that presents a risk, et cetera, et cetera. 
So in contract law, one of the things that you study and that the courts have looked at is like, well, what about when people break a contract? You know, what, what do we, how do we do, how do we relate to that societally? What, sh what should we do about that? And instinctively, like kind of intuitively, especially when it's your agreement, you've made an agreement with someone and then they're like, I'm actually not going to sell this to you. I'm going to go over here and sell it to this person. Instinctively, we're like, that person should be punished. They're wrong for what they did. They, they made an agreement. And the way the court should hold an agreement is that you made an agreement, you should follow through with it. Which makes sense, but it's a bit of a simplistic perspective. And so how the courts have assessed this is they've arrived at least in Canada and most of the world these days, they've arrived at this conclusion that it's a good thing for people should break contracts at time. If I make a deal with you, but there's an opportunity to make far a hundred times more money by making that deal over here, then so as to maximize our wealth and our own fulfillment and all of that, I shouldn't be forced down a particular path. I should be able to say, actually, you know what? I'm going to back out of this and I'm going to go in this direction. Otherwise, what's going to happen, the court's reason, is people are going to become ever more hesitant to ever get into a deal. And there's a benefit to getting into deals, to making promises. So you can start to see the calculus that courts are making. They're not just looking at like, well, what feels right internally, but like what allows society to be as fully expressed as possible? How do we best work within all of what is happening and, and all of what can come up? And so their rationale is that it's not a bad thing to break a contract, but you should remedy the person that has relied on your promise if you do so. So that means if I say, hey, I am going to give you a hundred widgets and you say, great. And then you go over here and make a promise to this person and say, look, I'm going to spend $10,000 on the basis I'm going to get these 100 widgets from Adam. So you now have my money. I, the original person selling those widgets, will now be on the hook for that cost. I'm simplifying a bunch here, but I hope you get the idea. Really where the courts look is it's okay to break an agreement. In fact, for society to function in a way that makes sense and is kind of for the best of all and is not rigid, you have to be allowed to break your agreement. You just have to be responsible for the consequences of doing so. What's cool to me about this is this is ultimately what we're talking about when we look at integrity too. If you always keep your word, if every time you say you're gonna do something, you actually do it, the only way for you to really achieve that is to be super miserly with where you give your word and to play a really small game in life where you can control everything. And then you know there's never gonna be any chance that I give my word and I don't follow through with it. If you're committed to playing a big game and to leaning out onto the skinny branches and really creating something beyond what you already know how to create, you're going to need to make some commitments and you won't always be able to make those commitments. In fact, you must fail to do so at some times because that's the only way you're going to learn new ways of showing up to create new results that you previously were unable to. So it's kind of the same thing that they've arrived at. So now that you are ready to go and practice law, disclaimer, do not go and practice law. Let's talk about what Hannah's saying, which is like, how about learning to say no and withdrawing from an agreement or a contract? So where do we kind of, <laughs> hey, Toku, I hope the trepanning is going well. For all those that, you don't, that don't know what trepanning is, trepanning is, um, it's not a widely done practice now, but there was a period of time where they would drill, literally drill a hole in the center of your forehead to relieve pressure in your cranium. That's called trepanning. <laughs> Very delicate art. You don't want to go too far or you're going to be in trouble. Gruesome. <laughs> not, um, boy, oh boy, I'm not interested in that. But anyhow, that's what trepanning is. Um, so how do we learn to say no and withdraw from an agreement or contract versus like staying in the contract? When we've made a commitment, what's the right place to be? So I want to establish kind of like the underpinnings of what we're going to talk about here, which is all you people chatting it up, connecting in this call. This is cool. I like it. Um, so the first thing is that this question is a little bit like, here's an analogy or a metaphor, and then I'll draw on that. When you go to the gym, 
there's kind of two places you can hang out. If you're lifting weights, the first thing is that you have a capacity for what you can currently lift. So maybe for you, it's a five pound set of, bias of um, dumbbells, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 50, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But when you go to that gym, there's a couple caveats. We all know we need to lift beyond our capacity. So if all you ever did is lift the weights that you can easily do within your existing capacity, you'll never grow your muscles because they're never being pushed beyond their limits. But the caveat to that is that if you go to that gym and try to lift 500 pound dumbbells, I don't know what gym has these, but let's say that you find some, you're so far beyond your capacity, there will be no growth. In fact, what you're gonna do is cause harm to yourself. You're stretching too, too, too far beyond your capacity. So we have to find that sweet spot. Where's that point where I'm pushing out past my capacity, but at the same time, I'm honoring my capacity. I'm not, I'm not using my capacity to, to like a crutch to hobble me or to keep me from growing, but I'm also not pretending that it's not there. That's the art in any kind of growth. That's when we talk about, a, or when I talk about a gradient, a good coach works with their client or a good leader or coach really works with their client or their direct reports to find what's the gradient for this person to operate on. There's a few more things here. One is that we're not the best at determining our own capacity. We, we tend to skew to one of those two extremes. So for some of us, we'll skew towards our staying within our capacity under the, our ego will call it under the guise of like, what feels good to me? What feels comfortable? I, why should life be a struggle? Um, sometimes I'll experience um, people that have some, um, some training in divine polarity. They'll talk about like, oh, I just want to fully embody my feminine, which is like, I'll just be in the moment. That, that can be a way that the ego grabs a hold of that tool and then uses it to have you just play in what is currently comfortable for you. So hanging out in that place, you're never really pushing beyond your capacity. You don't have to experience a lot of discomfort because our discomfort exists outside of what we're currently holding the capacity to be with. The other side of it would be people kind of, I tend towards this side often, which is we skew more to like, I fucking got to do it. Like, I need to be there yesterday. I'm already behind. I got to push. And so we stretch ourselves. We we don't really have a sense of where our limit is and what would best serve us. We try to push beyond that. And again, for people that have training in like divine polarity, the yoga of sexuality, stuff like that, these people tend to be overly identified or their ego grabs a hold of this notion of it being a masculine practice to do this. So they'll, I, I'm going to show up and I'm going to push beyond where I'm comfortable, which is great. but they just skew too far to the one side. So both of these are problematic. Both of these will hinder your growth. And, and even though on the surface, it looks like they're hindering it differently, the underlying impact's the same. You will get stuck within your capacity. You won't be able to really grow and transform and create something beyond where you're currently at. So I'm going to talk about Hannah's question inside the context of two different containers. One is a transformational container and one is whatever the other container is that's not transformational. So there's like a million different types of containers agreements we can make that aren't intended to be transformational. Like I could say, hey, I'm going to show up to class every week this, this week. And my class, the intention is that I learn about a programming language. That's not intended to create transformation. That's not the underlying intention of going to that class. The underlying intention of going to that class is I'm going to learn how to program in Java or whatever. It's not to say that there's not the opportunity for transformation. Transformation is available and the opportunity is there all the time. It's that that container, that agreement is not, the underlying intention of it is not to cause transformation in you. When you make a commitment or an agreement with a coach, assuming that they're a coach that does the kind of work that we're here to talk about, or when you choose into something, a commitment or a project with a leader supporting you, assuming that they're kind of the leaders that we're here talking about, those are containers with the intention, first and foremost, being to support and cause your transformation. 
So we've got two different types of containers. I'm going to talk about the transformational one, which is over here. I'm going to talk about that one second. First, we'll talk about a non-transformational container. So this might be like you make an agreement with your friend. Hey, I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to hang out with you every night for the next week. Let's make a BFF pact. Remember when people said BFF? Me too. I'm going to make a BFF pact. And that's going to be what we're going to do. And I'm going to hang out with you every night for two hours. And then there may be a point where you're like, I want to spend time by myself. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to go and spend time with my friend. That doesn't feel that good. So in this instance, all there really is to do is to tell your friend that and then be with whatever your friend has to say about that. You've broken an agreement. So now you just have to be willing to be with the impact and clean up any mess that makes. Your friend might be like, I feel like I don't matter to you and you made a promise to me and it just doesn't count for much. I get it. I, I can see how that'd be the case. That makes sense. What can I do to like make it like I'm, I'm still committed to spending this time by myself, but I also don't want to leave you feeling that way. Like, is there anything I can say, provide, hear more of anything along those lines to like clean up the mess that I've made? I get that I've made a mess. So that might be how we would be, how we would say no in an agreement we've made in a way that has us be responsible for our impact and all of that sort of stuff. When it comes to like a, com a container or an agreement that's non-transformational, there's not really more to it other than just a willingness on your part to say no, and then to be with the impact of that. Side note, before we talk about the transformational container, we don't like being with our own impact. That's why when we say no, we tend to not do it in a very powerful, intentional way. We instead tend to say no like, oops, I forgot about the call and I'll just let them know an hour later, oh my God, I got really busy, I'm so sorry. Or just when it's on a date in a relationship, ghosting them. I'm just not gonna talk to this person ever again. Ha, ah, now I don't have to be with the impact of me being a no to them. So, and then there's a whole bunch of other strategies we have. So that's kind of what there is to do in a container that the intention isn't to support your own transformation. Now. I want to talk about the transformational container because that's where I'm more interested personally, and that's where things are a little different. Before we move off of this one, though, it's important that the, the bedrock of where we've just like finished talking about is if you get to the point where you're a no, all there really is to do is to let all parties involved know that you are no longer going to be honoring this agreement and then find out, is there anything for me to do, blah, blah, blah. And people may be like, well, I want you to be a yes. And then our work in that instance is like, I understand, I'm still going to be a no. So aside from you wanting me to be a yes, and the fact that I'm not willing to be, what else can I provide? What else do you need? And, and maybe they just need to chew you out for a bit. You get, you know, things get a little complicated here. You know, are you going to stand and take the abuse or whatever? But for the most part, that's all there really is to do as far as a decision is concerned. Okay, so now let's talk about the cool shit, which is a transformational container. So a transformational container starts with that different intention, which is to support you in transforming the way you show up in your life. And in order to do so, that container is structured to have you get to the point where you are confronted, get to the point where you typically in your life would quit and support you in not quitting there. So the way that typically looks is that you have someone standing for you, a coach, a leader, someone that you've empowered this way and then entered into an agreement with. So in this instance, once you arrive at a no, that the, the, the difference in this container is the opportunity for you to relate to your no in a different way. In the first example I gave, my no was just like, I don't want to do it anymore. Therefore, all there is for me to do is to share that and move on. In a transformational container, the opportunity for me is, oh, I'm a no. And this container is intended to support me going past the point in my life where I stop. The purpose of this container, the entire reason I chose into it is so that when my no comes up, I can get supported to have it go differently than just choosing out. And so that container is designed to not collude with you choosing out. 
the whole intention of the container and the person holding it, your leader, your coach, whatever, is to stand for you when you get to a no and invite you and support you to see a different opportunity than the typical no. This starts to get very challenging. It gets challenging because standing for you in the face of your no can occur. And one of the best ways to get someone to stop standing for you is to point to it this way. It can occur like, well, you're trying to make me do something I don't want to do. You're not honoring my sovereignty. You're forcing me down a path. This is why standing for someone is such an art is because their ego is going to do whatever it needs to do to get you to stop standing for something other than their no. And their ego, one of the most effective ways is like, this feels unsafe. If you hear those words, and I've led and supported tons of groups, and safety is often a conversation that shows up. And as soon as someone says, this feels unsafe, you the we need to all buy a record. It's like there's a record player in every group conversation, and that's the point where the DJ scratches the needle all the way across the record, and then maybe all the way forward, and then all the way back one more time for good measure. Now, the danger here is that this then becomes permission for someone to just go and be a bully. So you got to be doing your own work. That's why this is being supported by your own leaders and coaches is so crucial so that you can navigate these challenging waters and work with other people's egos by being supported yourself in the same regard. So people will be like, I don't feel safe. You're trying to force me into this or whatever it happens to be. Let me just make sure I've got my feet on the ground in this conversation and see where we're at. So the role of the leader or coach holding this container for you. Can you guys let me know if this is making sense too in the comments? Cause it's, it's a bit of a challenging thing and I'm trying to pull apart the bits and pieces, but if any of this is a little bit hard to follow or anything, please let me know so that I can, I can kind of adjust as we go. So the job of the coach and the leader supporting you, holding this container, standing for your transformation, when your no comes up is to be unattached to how you choose and to keep standing for you. And so the way they might do that is like, I get it, you're at the point where you're a no. And you chose into this conversation, you chose into this container because you wanted something available beyond the point where you stop. And over here it occurs, like this is the point where you stop. So are you open to a conversation where we take a look at that? That's the artful part. And if the person's like, no, if the person is just a flat out no, we have to let them, that's how we keep the space actually safe. That's how we actually honor their safety is anytime they're like, I'm a no to any more conversation, the conversation is over. You honor that. But we check it. Okay, I got it. You want to choose out of this container, but I want to just support you in seeing what might be going on here so you can get a bit of altitude. And so what's really happening typically in a transformational container is, is that moment when you're at the gym doing a bench press and you're certain there's no way you can do any more and you want to set the weights down. And that's the point where the trainer says two more, two more. And so you do two more. You surprise yourself. You push past your capacity. And that's where the growth happens is in those last two sets after the point where you were certain you had not an ounce left of push left in your body. The same thing is happening in a transformational container in who you're being. Okay, I, someone say that this is making sense, please. Just so I've got someone checking my feet because I'm gonna kind of shift now and summarize what we've talked about. A little bit of sip of tea. I don't like how Facebook puts a delay on it because I can't get real time Real-time feedback from you guys, which is dumb. Give me the real-time feedback. Or maybe the comments have turned off. No, they're still there. Okay, well, I'm just gonna trust that this is making sense and landing for people. So the challenge here is, okay, great. Thank you, Kristen. The challenge here is that the human thing and sorry, the, the actual challenge is most containers are not transformational. And until we've had someone powerfully hold a container like that for us, we have nothing to compare it to. It's, in, it's entirely outside of anything we're used to. And in fact, what most of the world is engaged with is your no is sacred and we stop as soon as that shows up. With 
places where it's sort of carved out as an exception, like the gym with your trainer, right? Where it's like very, mm. uh, hey, Darren, I like that. I want to know, tell me about T-U-F-F with a capital T. Uh, tell, tell me why, what, like, what does that mean? I, I think you're just saying tough, but it's kind of cool. And I want to know what the deal is with that. So when I reach the point where I'm a no inside of an agreement I've made into a transformational container, my work, I say, is to practice trusting the container and trusting the coach. So when a client often have people come to me that are working with another coach and they're like, Adam, I'm, I feel like it might be time for a new coach. I don't know, you know, is there a point when I shouldn't be working with my coach, blah, 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 blah. And there's two things that happen there. The first one is a lot of coaches are not really very deep in their work. And so the answer is probably, yeah, you should be working with your coach. But before even addressing that, where I wanna look is with the client, are you bringing what's showing up in the relationship to your coach? So if I'm a no, I want to bring that to my coach. If I'm sort of like, ah, Rachel, I'm feeling like I'm not getting my value and like it's time to quit and things aren't working. Can we talk about that? That's what there is for me to bring. In a transformational co container, whatever is showing up, we have to be in the act of trusting that whatever is showing up for us is the work to be done. And then we have to be open to allowing the container and the people holding it to support us in doing that work. What tends to happen is most people get into these containers and then one, the people holding it aren't really able to hold very powerfully the container. And two, they get to the no and they're like, oh, the work for me to do here is honor my no. And then they just leave. And that's like, oh man, all of the opportunity in that moment just got flushed down the toilet. The opportunity was to bring that into the space. Hey, I made a commitment to be here and I'm trying, I, I can feel myself wanting to leave that commitment. Can we work on that? Can we address that? Can we support me with that? So the important thing to realize in all of this is anytime you're inside, anytime you've made a commitment, an agreement, or you've chosen into a container that's going to source your transformation, you will almost certainly reach your version of wanting to be a no. You will almost certainly, because that's the moment when you've gotten confronted. And that's the point where the work can both really make the most difference for you. And it's gonna be the point where you're the most resistant to it making the difference. This is, if you've ever seen that image, it's a very famous, well, I don't know if it's famous, but like well-known image of like, um, it shows sort of this underground and there's two guys and one of them, they're both digging with pickaxes and they're digging towards these treasures. And the one guy is just a tiny bit of wall left and the treasure's right there and he's turned around and he's walking backwards, dejected. That's what happens in these moments. We're right at the treasure. Finally, we're at the point. And then we're like, you know what? I'm gonna, our ego does all of its games. I'm gonna hold myself sovereign. I'm gonna honor what's showing up here. I'm just, this is the time for me to listen to myself rather than anyone else, blah, 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 blah. So bring it into the container. All right, well, I think that's uh, that's what there is to say about that. That theme we're gonna come back to a lot with these topics that we have. Um, that is cool, Darren, I like that. Tough, T-U-F-F, -F. be tough, like tough, the super wonder pooch. He's tough and you can be tough too. All right, let's have a sip of tea. Alexandra, always with the great topics. Thank you, Alexandra. She says, writes, breaking your, uh, talk about breaking through your upper limit when you are a cycle breaker and take ownership of your growth and development and well-being, but you end up being in a very different mindset and energy from your family. How do you navigate still enjoying and pursuing your happiness and being present to the suffering and hardships of family members? Excuse me. That's a really common one. And uh, it's a great place that our ego grabs a hold of the work or the transformation or the growth or whatever word you want to call it. Um, and that's your ego's job. So trying to be like, ha, my ego never does that anymore. Mm, well, that's weird. You've just lobotomized a part of who you are. That is what your ego is supposed to do is it's supposed to grab yesterday's breakthrough and then use that today to hold you in the place that's safe. So the way this works is we kind of like create some transformation and we can now we're like, oh, wow, I don't have to suffer in my life. How awesome. 
And then we go and be with people that are suffering and we're like, ah, you fools, they're so unenlightened. If only they knew. And then we have a couple options. One is to like, I hate my family or to disown them. Another would be sort of um, a little more, maybe I'd call it arrogant. And it sounds a bit nicer, which is like, oh, it's okay. They're just, I understand if they had what I had, they wouldn't be suffering, but it's okay because they're just operating at a lower level. So blah, blah, blah. So that's like, you can feel the arrogance in that, right? It's sort of like a pat on the head, patronizing. If only they knew what I knew, they wouldn't choose to suffer. So the heart of, um, well, actually, first I'm gonna share something. Uh, there's an author uh, who grew out of Landmark named Lawrence Platt. His writing is hilarious. He's got a background in um, computer science and uh, he, he's just this quiet dude writing about transformation like two times a week. I'm on his mailing list. I got there from someone else who put me in touch with him. And he writes, his posts are super, super dense and they're cross-referenced and linked everywhere. And like a lot of, you know, uh, if you've ever taken Landmark, the rigor of the language is really present. So it's like, my transformation, that is to say the way I am being, by which I mean the being that blah, blah, blah. So it, it can be a little dense to read through his stuff. But anyhow, he also writes some really profound things. And I reached out to him and I was saying like, ah, you know, I'm, I, I recognize the opportunity for me in my life is to kind of be with all of it. But then at the same time, I noticed myself getting really angry and I don't feel like I'm not meant to be angry, but then how do I be with people? Ah, what is the thing? And he wrote back and offered me some things. But the heart of what he said was, you know, to, to get some transformation in your life so as to never have the emotions you don't want to be with would be to miss the point of transformation entirely. You still get to have all of your emotional range. In fact, you get to have more of it as a human. You just have a whole rich set of distinctions and tools to support you in living and creating powerfully with like in partnership with all of those parts of you that are showing up rather than being put at the effect of them. So what tends to happen is people get a bit of enlightenment or a bit of meditation or a bit of transformation under their belt. And they're like, ah, I can be with it all. Then they go with their family and their family are showing up the way their family are showing up uh, just like humans do. And they're like, ah, it's so annoying. They're suffering. They're doing this. If only they were like me, then blah, 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 blah they can't be with suffering. So they're holding, the, their ego has kind of fooled them into believing, ah, I can now be with suffering. I don't need, I don't, I don't have a problem with suffering. I'm okay with it. And therefore I don't have to be with it. And what is driving you nuts about your family, what is showing up in your family that's hard to be with is actually pointing to you. It's pointing you towards the next thing for you to expand your capacity to be with. So if your family tends to be loud, overly loud and take up a lot of space. Can you be with that such that it's not a problem at all, such that you don't even relate to it like they should be any different? This is the heart of transformation. Can I show up in the world and be with the world in such a way that there's, it's all perfect? It doesn't mean that I, it doesn't hurt me or make me sad or make me mad at times, but also that whatever it creates in me, I can be with that too. Oh, my dad's being really loud and cutting me off. And that's making mad. That's making me mad. And can I hold that as perfect? Like that he's being that way and that it's making me mad. That's perfect too. And I don't need that to be different at all. So what's often happening with what Alexandra is talking about is it, it's kind of like our ego taking transformation as a concept and as like a set of words and some language, and then using that to do the work of the ego rather than the work of our fullest expression. It kind of tricks us that way. Uh, I'm enlightened. If only these other, I'm woke. If only these other people were woke, they'd feel differently. And then things would be the way they're meant to be. No, not at all. That's not woke. That's not enlightened. That's your ego using that stuff for its nefarious purpose. Hey, Andrew, happy Friday. So what there is for us to do is what about how my parents, my family, my siblings, my friends, the world around me, what about the way it's showing up do I need to learn how to be with so that I can then take whatever step is next without it being wrong in any way, without it needing to be any different. That's where transformation really happens. The first step is for us to be okay with things exactly as they are. 
And this consequently, or incidentally, is the exact reason, it's the number one thing that gets in the way of people that wanna create transformation in their life, is that they have a problem and they are addicted. We, we are addicted to a solution to the problem. We have no capacity to just sit with the problem. It's not even really a problem, but that's the first thing. We have a capacity to be like, oh, here's how I show up, I procrastinate. All right, well, here I am procrastinating. Can I sit with this? Instead, we're like, I'm procrastinating, and then we react to it. So we judge ourselves for it. We hold it wrong. We make powerful, bold proclamations, how we'll never procrastinate again. We create solutions. We invest in techniques and tips and tricks. And all of that is rooted in this underlying way of relating to yourself as though there's something wrong. And as long as there's something wrong, you're kind of doomed to recreate the problem. So the first step is, what if it's totally fine? And that saying those words is not usually sufficient. This is often the work there is to do as coach. When I'm working with my clients, that's often the first place we're going is they're like, oh, wow, I've got a solution. Oh my God, this is fixed. I'm so excited. Everything's amazing now. Thank you for this work. I've created a breakthrough. And I'm often like, nope, probably not. Probably not. We just had one conversation and you're excited about this. But what you're excited about is that you don't have to be where you were. And the real breakthrough is going to come on the heels of you being okay with this never changing. Could you be with this without it ever needing to change? How would that be for you? Real transformation happens on the other side of that. Well, since Andrew has shown up, it seems like a good time for us to shift to some of his topics. So what do you have for us, Andrew? Um, which one do I wanna look at? Uh, okay, so you the second, topic Andrew brings is, he says, I've heard you talk a lot about how when you see someone with a different viewpoint, that I embrace looking at their side and sitting with what they bring. So this could be a different political viewpoint. We could be on the same side, but hold different perspectives. This could be Bay and I in a conversation, blah, blah, blah. So anything, someone with a different perspective. Is there a point where I say enough is enough and break contact, or do I continually keep the doors open for conversation? Such a great question because the first thing we start to develop in um, this line of work, like if you really take on transformation, one of the first things you can develop is an expanding capacity to be with more of life. So that's kind of like what Andrew's talking about in the first part of his question, which is, oh, I can just, this person's sharing a perspective that is not my own. Can I just be with it? Can I just hang out with them and let them be that way? And that can become, first of all, that's often a breakthrough at first, just a willingness to be with more of life instead of like trying to contract away from life. Ah, uh, that person's a Republican. I'm going to eliminate them from my life. Oh, that person doesn't believe in vaccination. Fuck them. I'm cutting them out of my life. And then what that does is it has you shrink the amount of life that you get to be with. It feels good as you're doing it because you're like, oh, I got rid of that stressor, but it doesn't actually grow your capacity. To take us back to the metaphor of the gym, it's like if lifting those heavy weights is uncomfortable for me and I don't like that, then I'm going to go back. I'm going to lower the amount of weights I'm lifting. That's what we're actually doing with our being. In the gym of our life, we are actively taking away the things that stress our being, which would be akin to taking away the, the heaviness, the heavier weights that stress our muscles. And it's through stressing our muscles that they grow. It's through stressing our being that we develop our being, that we grow. So that's the first step is like, oh, can I practice being with more and more and more? Can I grow? But then the flip side of that is that can become the new game for the ego once you start to create that breakthrough, which is, oh, I can be with everything. I can be with this bully threatening me with a knife, or I can I can be with this uh, this person spitting in my face and shouting at me on the street corner. and so the next stage has certainly been the next stage for me and for a lot of people is now that I know I can be with anything and that that choice is available. So this is where the difference is for a lot of people. They might be able to utter the words, oh, I can be with anything, but I'm going to choose not to. But in fact, they, if you really get a little deeper, there's no possible. They're not open to that. They're just saying those words. But if you're like, great, practice being with this, they'd just be a, a flat out no. Uh, no, I could. I just don't want to because X, Y, and Z. So it's not that they have to go and be with it. It's that that possibility is not even on the table. 
a brief digression to give you an analogy of how this shows up and then we'll come back to the conversation. Sometimes when I get coaches in my practice who have left a former career, they are dead set against ever going back to a job. They're like, no. And the first and most important thing for anyone in this profession of coaching as an entrepreneur that wants to really create a thriving practice is get a source of income because that's going to allow you to not worry about money so that you can breathe life and, and have spaciousness. And often those people are like, I'm not going to get a job. There's no way I'm going to get a job. So it's not that the thing here is that there's, there, there's no possibility. They're not even open to it. They've shut that door completely. And what that does is it eliminates their possibilities. And that energetically is transferred to everyone you talk to. So um, to bring this back to where we were talking about, initially, we're not even open to the possibility of being with that person that's different than us. We're just like, fucking shut them out. Gone. Dunzo. I'm donezo with you. I don't have to be with you. Hi, I'm growing while secretly shrinking. Then now you have the possibility and access to being with anything. The next stage is often like, great, now that that's always available, what do I choose? So this is kind of a subtle distinction. Now it's not that I don't have choice and I just go the path of least resistance. I have the capacity, the ability to choose all of it. So now I really do have some choice. And the conversation becomes this thing in front of me currently, I don't want, I, I, it's a stressor for me to be with. Like if someone was yelling in my face, that's hard for me to be with. And I would wager it's hard for you to be with too. It's not easy for us to stay cool and breathe deeply and hang out with and be with all of that. We have ways of shutting down, closing, et cetera, et cetera, for good reason. So then the conversation becomes whilst I could be with this, do I wish to choose to be with this? Is that what there is for me to choose to be with? So, and, and what dictates my actions, at least my decision from here is what am I committed to beyond my own comfort? So if all I was committed to was being comfortable, the forge would be a shitty program <laughs> and coaching with me would be crappy because I would never trigger you because you getting confronted, whoever you are is confronting to me. And so if my priority is my own comfort, and not feeling under pressure or not feeling whatever is just uncomfortable for me, I just won't confront you. And then I get to live this life that feels nice and looks cool, but it's not going to create much transformation. So in a situation like the forge or like with my clients, there's times when they get really mad and frankly, fucking shitty <laughs> towards me. And it's not because who they are, are is, is crappy people. These people are amazing and I love them dearly. It's that as humans, when we are triggered, we can get shitty. We all have this capacity. When we are, when we are confronted, we come back, we, we attack back. That's, what, that's how we defend ourselves. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways. And so with those people, I am committed to staying and being with them and to doing whatever work there is for me to do so that I can continue to, continue to stand with them and love, with, and love them. If someone on the bus started showing up with me the same way, I might have the same internal understanding of what's going on, which is like, oh, this person's probably not really mad at me. They're probably just having a bad day and I stepped in a landmine, but I'm not gonna bring them the same grace. I'm not gonna do a whole bunch of work to be with them because I'm not committed to that. In that moment, I'm going to I'm going to tell them to fuck right off and get out of my face and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to ensure that my sovereignty remains as it is, that they don't impinge on my personal space, that if they're yelling at me, I'm going to make sure that that doesn't continue happening and so on and so forth. So the place we're looking once we have access to all of it, once all of the possibilities are on the table is what am I actually committed to? This is also why when people are like, man, coaching's like, I'm committing a lot to this coaching, Adam, but what about you? It's all of the stuff that I'm like doing on the back that they don't, they're not aware of. You know, when you are working with a coach who's really standing for you, you don't really, you're not really present to their process and everything they have to do to work themselves out to continue just standing and loving you and not taking any of what you put into the space personally. And you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be present to that. That's that's why coaching is magnificent. Is by them moving their stuff out of the out of the space, it allows you to just have a perfect shiny clean mirror. 
even if that might require after the call finishes for them to cry for a while and then go get supported by their coach and reminded they're awesome and blah, blah, blah. So they can come back and show up with you and love you and all of that stuff. So for me, to your question, Andrew, I have varying levels of like, here's what I'm committed to in these spaces. With my clients, people in the forge, people I'm leading, that sort of stuff, there's almost no end to like what I will be with. It doesn't mean there aren't times when I have to assert a boundary with a client because that's what's going to support their breakthrough. But I can be with all of it and I will generate myself so as to be with my clients regardless. With my friends, or sorry, with my, my wife, it's a little bit of a different gradient, but I'll, I'll be with a lot with her. With my friends, a little bit less. And then with acquaintances, a little bit less and so on and so forth. So that's how it kind of works. That's how it plays out for me. I'm just going to read what you guys are sharing here. Mara is saying, my problem is I appear to show up by internally. I can feel myself numbing out or checking out emotionally. Can you say more about that, Mara? I don't think I quite followed what you were saying there. Andrew says, one of my frustrations comes with the stance that people have towards policing. Some people don't see how the anti-police perspective can really have on... Some people don't see the impact, I think Andrew's saying, of how the anti-police perspective can really have on day-to-day -day interactions with police in the world. A part of me wants to reject people of these beliefs, I've been pretty angry about it, but I'm also aware that my work needs to embrace some of those perspectives and see what people feel on the other side. I get that. Um, let me just, uh, there's a thing in my own life that's kind of similar to that. I'm just checking to see, like, does it serve me to mention that or, or just address what you're speaking to? Um, yeah, the... Politics, that, that's kind of a political conversation, right? Like policy-based, what, what's the right thing to do with police? The thing I've learned lately is um, there's, there's often like a next truth beyond the binary. We, whenever we get caught in something, we tend to become more and more linear and binary, which is why, you know, at least in the US political system, and frankly, the way a lot of people identify is either like you're this or you're that. And if you're centrist, you're just not willing to choose. There's not really much of an option. And on the one hand, what that does is it eliminates a lot of cognitive dissonance because I don't have to listen to anything you say. As soon as I identify and label you a certain way, I can stop listening to you. And that alleviates a ton of cognitive dissonance. The trouble is that cognitive dissonance is how we grow. So the more we eliminate cognitive dissonance, the less opportunity there is for growth. So with things like defund the police, when I listen to people share that stuff, I often find their, my experience as I listen to their perspective is pretty narrow and it feels very reactive. Like, yeah, you could do that. I, I think that's a pretty simplistic solution to an incredibly complicated problem. And kind of like if you imagine someone cracking a whip, the hand moves like that and then the, the energy travels all the way down the whip and then it's the end of the whip that that has all of that potential energy turned into kinetic energy and makes the loud snap and all of that stuff. Statements like defund the police or, you know, just do this often to me feel like someone looking at the tiny end of the whip cracking and being like, well, just, just pinch it or like, just stop that from moving. And they're not seeing like the reason that is having that effect is because of everything that happened down the wit all the way back to this hand holding it and then the brain that had me do that in the first place. So we often try to solve these problems at the very end of the whip and it won't work. It just won't work. It's, it's simplistic. So I often feel that same thing you do, Andrew. I'm like, ah, this feels so reactive. It's not going to solve the thing. Hey, Emmy, nice to have you with us. Uh, I have a check-in to send you. Um, I'll finish this thought. I want to share what with everyone what that check-in is about because it's kind of cool that we're working on that, Emmy. So for me, when people feel this like reactive, or at least when they occur to me as like reactive and like, fuck, just defund the police or whatever the thing happens to be, the, there's a part of me that's like, that's dumb. No. What I've been discovering in my own work lately is none of what I'm holding on to is helpful. Those people in that moment, what 
the only thing that's going to serve in that moment is to be with them and get them where they are. If I want people to get to a place of non-reactivity, I have to be willing to be with them in their re reactivity. We can't move past a place until we've been there. And so my insistence over here of like, there's this higher, more transcendent truth and oh my God, what you're saying makes no sense. And oh, you need to, you need to like let go of your reactivity would be like someone that got punched in the face by like someone that's just innocently walking down the street, swinging their arms. And the person's mad and upset because they got hit and this person was careless. I mean, being like, just don't be mad. Stop being upset. It was an accident. Can't we move on? Let's talk about puppies. That's cruel. It's not even not helpful. It's actually kind of cold. And so this, I want to be clear, is not me advocating anything for you, Andrew, but sharing what I can see for myself is that my insistence on that higher truth is actually more about my own willingness to be with people in their hurt. And whilst there may be something to that higher truth, it doesn't really matter. What there is for me to do is to like be with them in their hurt until I reach my own capacity. There's a point where I'm like, okay, this conversation now, I think this is fucking bullshit and I hate your face. Okay, that's that's my time to leave the conversation. Not because they're wrong and that their face is bad, but because I've reached the capacity of my ability to be with them in their hurt. And so then my work becomes, okay, I'm going to go do my own work, work myself out, and maybe I'll come back. And what I believe in my heart is that if we can be with each other, or maybe I'll make this more specific, if I can be with people however they're showing up, that will allow them the space to move to whatever is next. But in order for that to happen, I have to let go of the idea that they need to move anywhere other than right here. So really where that leaves me is, ah, defund the police, I hate that. Okay, that's my stuff. This person is at that place. Can I go and just be with it? And can I, can I work myself out and just sit with them? That's what we all need. That's what every single one of us needs is people to sit with us without needing us to be any different. And that requires, that requires more than almost anything I've experienced in my life. I've done a lot of hard stuff and just to continue to be with people, that is all of it. That's the whole game. And when people sit and be with us, this is kind of like what makes the being of coach and leader so transformational is I don't have to coach someone. I don't have to say anything to them, but if I can sit and be with them, in a way that has me okay with how they are showing up perfectly and not needing them to be any different, that will be transformative transformative in its own right. And they're going to be left with this experience like, whoa, I feel different. And then we go and be with the next person. That is beautiful work right there. Um, for what it's worth, Andrew, I'm really good at staying quiet and judging too. I'm also really good at sarcasm and I'm really good at cutting people's legs out from under them. So. Uh, I'm, I'm learning how to create art better and better and better. And I'm still a human. So there's still times when people, um, sometimes people like this part of me lives on <laughs> my ego grows as I do and becomes more sophisticated. So there's times when I'm trying to think of things that'll really get me, but like, um, if for example, someone on LinkedIn as an example, like reaches out to me and I'm like open hearted and like, I so appreciate what you're doing. No, thank you. And if they just keep coming at me, like they don't listen, there's a threshold where if, if it's like five times in a row and now they're pointing to how like all of this is about my unwillingness to like really blah, blah, blah. blah and I'm just being a coward and blah, it's rare that I get these because I'm, I'm pretty good with my art at this point. But when people do that, I'm like, okay, motherfucker, you just stepped over the threshold into my house. Now you're going to get both barrels of the shotgun in your chest. And I'll just, <laughs> they get they get the very much the part of me that was excellent at law, laying out why their case is stupid. Here's how you're being, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so that, that does come out from time to time, but um, I'm getting better at not. And what I notice is as I... Um, as I can be with more, there's less of that part of me that needs, that feels a need to be expressed. I'm right there with you, Cami. Yeah. To be with other people really requires to be with our own stuff. And it's so hard to, so hard to see that stuff. Really, really hard. Easier to see it and judge it in other people than to like notice how it's a reflection of ourselves. 
not just easier like um it's both literally easier like i can see out there better than i can see this way but easier like i just have less resistance to it as well all right great question andrew uh Jess says, talk about balancing prior, balancing slash prioritizing rest and productivity. So I'm going to touch on this really quickly, which is to say, uh, oh, no, first I want to talk about um, what I was sharing with Emmy. So, and then I'm going to come to what you said, Mara. Um, Emmy and I are checking in with each Emmy Drain, who you see uh, in the in the comments there, uh, lives in France and has a very fashionable sense of style and is delightful and amazing. And she had read, she'd asked for a copy of the Spectrums of Being, or Who Do You Think You Are, as it's now called. And I'd sent her an early edition. And she was like, I love this. I want to translate this into French. Do you want to partner with me on that? And I was like, hell yeah, that's amazing. And so um, she... She, now she made that offer before I then went and read and wrote like another 200 pages. <laughs> so she may be regretting that. I don't know, but um, so we're partnering on that and connecting with each other and sharing so that it doesn't just become a chore or something that Emmy or myself are doing in the dark all by ourselves and are actively like supporting each other to continue through that process. So um, if you are a French speaker, uh, oh, actually, I'll say that a couple of things. Actually, if you're if you're native tongue, or if you're FSL, or prefer to read in French, or even interested in French, <laughs> then um, let myself and Emmy know because we'll want people that can read it after the fact. And the good news is there'll be a version in French. You don't have to translate for yourself in English, and it'll be done with Emmy's extremely good style and French and prose and lovely taste of language and all of that. You know, the thing I loved the most about style in France when I first went there, Emmy, was shoes. What I noticed was, generally speaking, um, the style in France was a little more dressy, which is always appealing to me. I, gen I, I usually just prefer dressy. I like to dress up. It's fun for me. It uh, doesn't mean it's right. And what I noticed, though, is like I would see guys still wearing pants with a polo shirt, but their shoes were so good. And like every guy had shoes that were so nice and so good and sleek and well put together. And they definitely didn't look as comfortable to walk around in as like runners or the shitty shoes you buy from Aldo, but their craftsmanship was excellent and they looked so beautiful and they were so well-made. And I was like, Oh man, I am never buying shoes from Aldo ever again. I think at that point I'd moved on from it because buying your shoes from a place like Aldo is a terrible um, move for a whole bunch of reasons. The main one is that you think you're paying less, but you're actually paying more in the long run because their shoes break down so quickly. If you buy really good quality shoes, they'll last you forever. You can just replace the sole and you'll have those shoes for the rest of your life. Let Emmy know if you are interested in the French version, if that has anything, or if you know anyone that is in, yeah, scarves as well. Definitely. A e scalp? A e scalp? I can't remember what the name is. Anyhow, um, let Emmy and or I know if you know people that would be interested in supporting us by just reading that book ahead of time. That would really help us a lot. Okay. So, uh, Mara, you say, do, 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 do. Uh, you said, I look like I'm showing up, but then I find myself closing down my heart. I toughen up automatically. So what you're describing is growth. Really, that's the process is the fantasy of transformation is that we'll be like, um, oh, I'm so glad I read that thing, Adam, or whoever wrote. Now it'll be different. Oh, here it's happening. I'm feeling resistant. Okay, I'm going to choose out of it. Oh, sick. Look at all this transformation. That's the fantasy, how it goes. Or maybe you do a Jaeger bomb at the end of it. That felt like a Jaeger bomby voice. Do you guys remember Jaeger bombs? That was a thing, too. I've come to a better place. So uh, that's the fantasy of it. But the actuality of it is that we choose into a structure that'll support us or we try to take on a practice. And then like three weeks later, we're like, what the hell? I was so closed. Or we don't even realize it. We we try, we're practicing. We're like, oh, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm super open. And then someone's like, wow, I really experienced you as closed. And we're like, no, you didn't. That's your stuff. You're stupid. 
And then maybe a week after that, we're like still stewing on it. And then with some support from maybe a coach or something, we're like, ah, frig, they're right. I was really closed. Ugh. That's how the work can actually happen. So it ha you have to get toughened up. That has to happen. It's, it's an essential part of the process, which is why it's so important when what we want to move past is our judgment that we drop the story that we don't have judgments or that having judgments is somehow wrong. I see that a lot in coaching where people take these well-meaning but pretty, um, not necessarily short, they can be very long, but well-meaning, but just kind of like, uh, I guess I'll just call them shallow coach training programs, or they go off and do like a little bit of landmarks. So they get like a, a dip in the water. They get a taste of transformation or of the kind of language. And then they're like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to not judge people or like judgment's wrong. And oh my God, I'm seeing how much I'm judging people. And then they, they make it wrong that they have judgment. And the, the tragedy in that is that then it makes it harder for you to see when you have judgment because you're actively trying to push it down. And transformation is not about you pushing something down in your life. Transformation is about allowing all of it to come up and then being able to be responsible and to clean up the impact and make sure it's the impact you want to have. So anytime we're like, I shouldn't be judgmental. Ooh, that's let go of that. You got judgments. I do. We all do. That's part of being a human. You can start by delighting in them. Then you can start to do work on the other side. 12 hours, Mara, you were, Mara says 12 hours later, I got how numbed out I was. For me, it initially it was like months, maybe not months, plural, but like it'd take like a month or three weeks or two weeks. Uh, Kemi, you say, I was gonna share today and still will, good. <laughs> How when we declare a new way of being that it's an automatic for all the shit to rise, it has to like a detox. Yeah. As soon as we make any commitment that is going to take us past the threshold of where we currently stop in our lives to create transformation on the other side, that commitment, if you honor it, is going to drive up all of the shit. It has to, to Cammy's point. It's essential. It's a good thing when it happens. The, one of the early steps of this work is to when our shit comes up, when we are uncomfortable, when we are frustrated, when it feels like something's wrong out there, that we relate to that not as truth, but as like, oh, I'm in the process. This is where I'm meant to be. The process is working. Yeah, Andrew, I love that one. Andrew says, or oh, I can never be negative. So I'll always reframe and be positive. When people tell me, I'm when I'm a mat. I had a, a friend once, uh, love her a lot, but she was introducing herself to a group of coaches and she said, I am the master of reframing. Get out of here, Irvine, California. She, she said, I am the master of reframing. So if you need a reframe to do anything, blah, blah, blah. And the first thought that came to mind doesn't mean it was right. I want to be clear. But the first thought I had was like, I'm willing to bet this person is probably not very good at being with their sadness or anger. Because we often use reframe to like, ah, I feel bad. Don't feel bad. Here's why you can feel happy about it. And what that does is help us not have to be with feeling bad, which is then, then that's now the thing you're holding underwater. The beach ball that you have to hold under the water is feeling sad or feeling mad or whatever. So it's not that reframes are bad, but to your point, Andrew, they're often, eh, they're a little, they can be really sneaky for our egos. Our egos like those things. Okay, well, let's talk about what Jess is saying, which is, uh, yo, balance, talk about balancing slash prioritizing rest and productivity. This kind of goes back to our conversation about capacity and stretching past our capacity and then choosing into our um whatever. And like, how do I know where it's time for me to push that extra little bit, even though every part of me wants to stop versus it's time for me to stop because if I go any further, I'm going to hurt myself. And um, that's really tough. You know, that that's part of why I have a coach is because I find that really, really hard to I have a bit of a sense, but again, remember my ego grows with me. So every time I'm like, oh, got it. Here is where my edge is. 
well, I'm going to grow and then I'll have a new edge. And then my ego is going to be like, no, 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 but you remember from last time, here's where your edge is. So one of the funny, I was talking to my friend, Michelle, just today, and she was sharing, <laughs> she was sharing how her coach had said, you know, it seems like you need a break. And she, Michelle is deep in her work and a masterful leader and transformational just to, to know her. And she, she said when her coach said that, she just started to cry because she felt seen, so seen in that moment. And it's not like Michelle does not have her head up her ass. You know, she is deep, deep, deep in the work and we can't see this stuff ourselves. So there's, that's the first thing I have to say is that I don't have an answer for how to like, oh, just know it. Or sometimes the thing is like, well, if you just listen to yourself deep enough, you'll know. But to me, that's not that's a little bit like whatever I see is true. That's there's a little bit of that in it, which kind of steps over the fact that to see is to have a blind spot. So it doesn't mean that I need to, Oh, like if my coach says, Adam, it seems like you need a break that I'm just like, she said, I need a break. So I need to take a break. That's not what this game is about. And if that's the relationship you have with your coach, bring that to your coach. So you can change it. It's more that when my coach, offers me something like that, it gives me an opportunity to take a look at the places I may not be to try on what she's offering me and to say, how does this feel? And, you know, for Michelle, that felt really true in that moment, right? It's often like, oh my God, I really do need a break. So that's, that's the, the big bulwark of all of this for me is I don't have to figure it all out myself. And thank God, because that is exhausting. What I get to do is like go in the direction, like trust the direction I see and trust someone else to help me see the stuff that I'm missing on my journey. Just like having a co-pilot or in like a, you know, a rally race where the rally race, you've got the driver and then you have the co-pilot who's like reading out directions, letting them know what the curve is that's coming around the bend and all of that sort of stuff. And if the, if the pilot was trying to do all of that, they're getting in the way and they're not going to be able to do what they're doing as best they could. Hey, Alexandra, well, you're here for just the best part. Because you're here. So you're right on time. The other side of this is it's helpful for me to know what's my lean. So is my lean towards being hyper productive or is my lean towards being more focused on my well being? For me, my lean tends more towards being really, really productive and neglecting my well being rather than the other direction. So I'm always going to be a little bit like I just check that a little bit more. I'm more likely knowing that about myself to kind of ask the question, you know, if I'm like, do I need a break? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. And I'm like, do I need a break? You know, I'll ask it that second time because I know that my lean is in a particular direction. So I'm just more likely to check that. It doesn't mean that I don't have a, a, a huge opportunity that comes from my coach. She still doesn't see all of these things that I can't see. I've had other clients where well-being is the, you know, it's the, it's a beautiful thing and it's essential. And well-being was the reason they never did anything that was beyond their capacity. So they'd make a couple calls and they'd be like, I'm exhausted. I have to stop. And then they would take care of their well-being. And then next week or two weeks or three weeks, they're like, ah, nothing's happening. Great. What do we need to do? I need to get into action. They get into action. They get exhausted. I need to take care of my well-being. So these things become played off against each other rather than in partnership with each other. So that's the other side of it is when um, when I have someone I'm supporting where like that well-being thing tends to be the crutch that has them stop, the conversation I invite them into is a both and rather than an either or. So like, look, it seems like it's time for you to make a declaration that you are both going to make sure your well-being is handled and take the action you say you're committed to for however long you say you're committed to doing it. How does that land? You know, I, I might not just direct them towards that. I'd work with them to get there. But that's often what's going to create the difference because then they're going to get to that place where they're like, I'm exhausted. I can't keep doing this. I need to take care of my well-being. And then the opportunity is, well, like, how are you going to fulfill on your commitment? How are you going to do both of those things? Well, I need to take a break. Great. Take a break. But then I won't be able to do this. Well, you're going to have to let something else fall. You might have to be willing to like say no to that date, but that's important to my well-being too. As you work with people in this, you'll notice everything that they're currently doing in their life is a function of well-being 
accept the stuff that they say that they're really committed to. So we want to, there's like that art in working with all of that. Andrew, you're the type that will go full steam ahead and create a lot in say a month. Then you'll need to slow down the next month in recovery mode. It's been interesting to see this dynamic play out and creating more awareness around it. Yeah, that's what a lot of people pendulum. So we go extreme. I, I can be like this because part of what I bring into the world is passion and passion tends to swing wildly from one pole to the other. It's like a throttle that has two positions, maximum velocity and fuck it. So when I'm not actively responsible for my well-being, I get swept up in my passion and I stop bothering to sleep or eat and everything becomes just a distraction from all that I want to do and learn about and read about. And then once that has gone on long enough, I kind of, uh, I need to fix the lighting in my office. It's, it's changed on me. It's like, you need sexier mood lighting. Let me do that for you. Uh, there we go. So once I've hung out in maximum productivity for long enough, I reach a point where my well being is no longer really being kept. And then I swing all the way to the other side of like, fuck it, I don't want to do anything. And then I'm just working with my well being and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you say, Cammy? You say sometimes it's listening to that other voice, depending on what is automatic. In my experience, that is the voice of my soul, my higher self. I often don't want to hear or follow that voice as it's not my automatic. Yep, absolutely. So there, there is often a part of ourselves that, um, we often know on some level, like, oh, I do need a break, but cultivating the ability to hear that voice and then even further to actually listen to it can be challenging. And we often have resistance to it because we are trained out of listening to our natural voice and we've learned not to trust ourselves. So why would I listen to this voice coming from within? The stuff to trust is out there. I trust the money I have in the bank rather than trusting in my ability to get by and to make enough money to sustain myself. That's a great example of where a breakdown in trust can occur like the accumulation of a great amount of wealth. But if you've accumulated great vast amounts of wealth in reaction to an inability to trust yourself, there's not ever going to be enough. That's why you see these people who have huge tracts of wealth and are just racing to the bottom. They're trying to get more and more and more and more. When I, sometimes when I help coaches around their niche, the, an early thing will be like, I'm, I want to play with a bigger level of client that are like not afraid to invest in money. And so I need to start like finding people that are like up to bigger things in their life which on the one hand is like great, but often if you dig into that a little bit, what we find is that the person is, they're, um, the coach is scared, triggered, and just not yet able to support people overcoming their fear. One of the first reasons we'll, we'll put into the space to not step into our fear is I can't afford it yet. And so their thinking is, well, I'm gonna aim towards those billionaires or those millionaires or those hundred thousand heirs or whatever, because they have enough money and they they won't, blah, blah, blah. Those people have even more, even more scarcity around money. That's why they've amassed so much of it. There's never enough for them. So it's funny how these things work. And it's also neat because then the coach's reaction to their own fear actually recreates the problem. They find those people are even more scarce with money and then then the coach is like i need an even bigger client and then it just never ends right? and it just becomes a vortex we can't solve a uh an internal a, a, an issue created by our internal state by um an external solution it never works andrew says adam have you noticed that every topic you cover feels like pure gold i'm always so impressed at how much insight you bring to these <laughs> Andrew, I have noticed that. Yeah. I, and often, you know, I'm just like feast, feast on. No, I'm just being a bit silly. Thanks for saying that. Here's what I've learned to that. So first of all, I really appreciate you saying that. And it's a beautiful acknowledgement. And I love your, um, I love the way you have of acknowledging me. Here's where I've kind of gotten to these days is a, a former client of mine reached out and he was like, hey, he was sharing some books he was really excited about reading. I think he was reading, oh, The, the Coaching Habit by, what's his name? I got it over here. Michael, Michael Bungay, which, first of all, the word bung, B-U-N-G, is hilarious to me. I don't know why. I, I think it just sounds funny and bung it in your mouth. You've bunged it up. I like that. So anyhow, Michael Bungay. It's a great book. 
never mind the the childish delight that I have of his last name. If we were friends, he would never hear the end of it. That's probably why we're not friends. Probably the only reason. So anyway, my client reached out and was like, hey, have you read The Coaching Habit? Really great book. And I was like, yeah. And then he was asking me, what have I been reading? What am I excited about? What books have really been blowing my mind? And I was reflecting on how I, there's not, I don't read a lot of um, non, well, I guess like, you know, this massive tome is a nonfiction book, but I don't read a lot of books with the intention of learning something new these days. And I was, I was wondering why that was like, is that arrogance? Is that, you know, what is it? So I'll read books that fascinate and interest me. And I'll read lots of fiction books because I love reading. It's very joyful for me. Um, but not like I don't read a lot of coaching books or leadership books or like, you know, I'll try to pick them up. And sometimes I'll read a little bit like I read most of Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. And, and I was just sitting with this, like, what what is it that motivates that? these days, because I used to read a ton. When I first started in this line of work, I voraciously consumed everything I could find. And what I've come to is that the more I deepen my own work, I'm less interested in learning something externally inwards. I'm more interested in discovering what there is for me to discover on my own journey via myself. That doesn't mean like the, the caveat is I wanted to do that also when I was younger, but I was doing it from a very arrogant place, which was like, I've learned it all. Let me teach the world. Now, um, it's kind of like, well, nothing in a book that I can read where someone's written like, here's how relationships are, is ever as compelling to me as when I work with my coach on what's showing up in my own relationship and discover the truth for myself in that. And so, first of all, that's to me, I was like, oh, wow, that's that's cool. And I love coaching. That's so cool because from my work with my coach, I discover my truth rather than a truth out there. And my truth is not the truth for anyone, but I believe it has value. And so that's the first part. And then to your beautiful acknowledgement, Andrew, I think that what leads to them being like these topics being powerful is that I'm just generating from my being. And that's the promise for all of us is that we can drop that this stuff is something we're right about and we can just share our own discovery in our own process. And when we do that, we provide so much value to other people because it's not something they need to know. It's not something that they're right about. It's simply a willingness for us to share our own journey. I want to have a sip of tea and then talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> I like that name of that book, Alexandra. Coaching skills. Who wrote coaching skills? I'm not familiar with that. Um, I was reflecting on, there's a number of teachers that are, that have either added me on Facebook or I'm connected with, or I've added them or whatever. And I was noticing what showed up within me as I scrolled through Facebook and just saw posts. And what I was present to is that there's a lot of brilliance in the world, first of all, and I have the good fortune of being connected to a bunch of it and getting to like engage with it and um, and absorb it and, and all of that. And then what really inspires me, like what I find the medicine that goes down the best for me, so to speak, is when someone is willing to take on the humility and the courage to share their own process. That for me is always the height and the most profound teaching because then I can see something for myself in their selfless and courageous sharing of their own journey. There are a lot of people on my Facebook feed who have a lot of brilliant things to say and they're sharing it for me. Like they're sharing it at me. Here, here is what I think for you. They're not using those words. It's who they're being about it. And what always leaves me floored is when someone just shows up and is like, here's what happened. Here's what I got. And I can feel the, their vulnerability. And I'm just like, oh, wow. Wow. I can really see something for myself in that. And the reason I can see it is because they're not sharing it for me to see something. They're sharing it as a gift. And that gives me a lot of spaciousness to then really let myself get into it as opposed to that, like, let me teach you something. 
which is really prevalent. And when someone's like, let me teach you something, we tend to be like, who the fuck are you to teach me something? We get very New York. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. <laughs> uh, Andrew, that's so interesting to hear that it comes from your being and creation, less of the knowledge and facts of books. That's really, yeah. Another, a friend of mine, Ernest, who you guys may have seen um, from time to time commenting on these said, uh, he was remarking like, how do you, how do you talk for an hour and a half, <laughs> not be exhausted by that? Like, that seems like a long time to be on. And the beauty of this work is that the deeper you go, the less you're being on. There's no being on to it. We're just being, which is beautiful because from just being, there is no draining. This is why we, the, this, this is the heart of that phrase, time flies when you're having fun. Well, the truth is, it's actually not that. Time flies when you're being. A different way to put that or a more, that is to say, the Lawrence Platt way would be, time flies when you are fully expressed. So when we're just expressing ourselves, there's no notion of time. There's no waiting something out because we're just being who we're being. There's there's nothing to it. And so um, that's that makes all of this stuff really easy. We have to practice. So we have to lean into the places where we're not yet fully expressed and then practice there. And when we're leaning into those places, it can feel pretty excruciating. Like the first time I ever did a podcast or the first time I did a live or any of this stuff. But as we expand and can be with more of it, it just becomes, oh, cool. I can be with that. That is different from when people become really good at doing something, but are not fully expressed in it. So the example of that would be someone that like doesn't really they're very nervous about public speaking, but they've learned to adopt a funny, jokey persona that's always on, that can do it and that the crowd kind of likes. And so what they do is they show up and they give a great show, but then internally they're, they're putting on something and that's exhausting for them. I have a friend who um, is quite well known and, and does um, emceeing for some big events. And uh, I was at an event and, and I was, watching him on stage. I'm like, man, this guy's hilarious. And I'm exhausted watching him. Like it just felt like the show was always on. And I've actually spent some time with him and had the same experience. Like with me, it's just like joke, joke, energy, energy, joke, blah. And, um, and so anyhow, we were at this event and, um, he was off stage eating and I, and I was like, Hey man, can I, you know, I was just wandering around chatting with people, having a good time. And I'm like, Hey, do you want some company or would you rather chill out? And because uh, I kind of had a sense, he's like, yeah, I'd rather just chill out. And um, without making him wrong for it at all, I was just like, ah, oh, I can, uh, I imagine you'd want to chill out because my experience of you is that you're never not on. The only time you really get to not be on is when you're off, when you're by yourself, then you don't have to do this show and probably around certain people where he feels comfortable enough to drop that show because the show is the armor. And the reason that's so familiar for me, the reason I can see that is because that's exactly how I used to be. So I, I would find there's this interesting um, question that used to be asked in an exercise I, I used to do with people, which was, how would you be if you were at a party and you knew no one there? What would that be like for you? And then I'd explain it. And then the next person was like, okay, great. And now what if you were at a party and you knew everyone there? And you know, what was interesting to me was being at a party where I knew everyone was way more work, so stressful. And I used to really, uh, my fear still grabs a hold of this, but like the idea of worlds colliding. So like work meets friends. Oh my God, that was terrifying to me. And it really like scared me because I felt the need to do so much managing. And I felt the need to like bring work persona Adam to meet person like friends persona Adam and how do these two things combine and what ha that's why we get caught up in work life balance is because we're creating ourselves as two different people in two different places and then we have to balance that out on the other side of a lot of work there's no the Adam you're getting right now is the Adam you get in a coaching conversation is the Adam that my mom gets to go hiking with tomorrow, which I'm excited about, is the Adam that gets to you get to be with at a wedding and so on and so forth. And there's no managing anymore. I don't have to make sure people are having a good time because I can be with them not having a good time. 
I don't have to talk to one person, but constantly be looking over their shoulder to see if I need to manage that person right behind them who looks like they're having a bad time and feels lonely. Because I used to have no ability for myself to feel lonely. So I had to manage it at my party if someone else did. It was exhausting. And so I can see that in my friend. I'm like, oh, wow, you're, you're really needing to run the show. And to, your, to Cammie's point, she says, it's also exhausting for the audience. And it is. You know, that's why these people tend to, they're the MC, they come on, they're delightful, they bring up the energy and then they leave because there's, it's, it's too much kind of burn out on it over time. How uh, would you say here, Alexandra, the deeper you go, the less you are on. I relate to this so much, basically the essence of what motherhood showed me, I bet. When things go south with the baby, my mind makes me Google or read books. It feels so ah, tense and it doesn't work and we both hate it. Then I give up fixing and I just kiss her forehead again and again and accept whatever emotions she brings in herself and me. And then everything changes. Practicing that so many times opened my heart in a beautiful way. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Alexandra. That's beautiful work. Cammie, referring to the guy I just described as me, says, I remember that guy. Me too. Yeah, he, uh, that version of me can still show up from time to time, but like I can catch it a lot sooner. I'm, I, I, I can distinguish it. I'm not like, that's just the way I am. I'm like, oh, I'm scared right now. What do I need? How can I step into my fear? What do I need to be with? What's the opportunity here? And life becomes way less effort, way more of a breath. Andrew, if you'd be willing to share, what what are you in the party example? How do you show up? Is it you'd prefer to be with the people you know? What if they were, so for me, it was like, I'd rather be at a party with people that I know all from the same area. Then I'm like, I know where I stand in this group. The next best would be people that I don't know because then they don't know who Adam is. So Adam can just be whoever Adam is. So like I used to love going to weddings because like there was a bunch of people that didn't know me and I got placed at a table and I was just like, I'm going to give them this version of Adam. I'm going to be the undertaker. I never went that far, but like I just get to be whatever. There was no pressure. And then the last one was like the worst would be being at a party with a bunch of people from all different walks of life. Nightmare. Uh, Cam says so definitely hard to keep away. No worries missing the talk, Cam. Good to have you with us. Hard to keep away from trying to fix things with kids. The ultimate area to just hold space is with kids stepping into new emotions. Yes, indeed. And Andrew, you're saying you definitely get anxiety being at a party alone while seeing everyone else having conversations. If I'm at a party with people I know, I find comfort and relaxation in it. Yeah, I used to, um, I'm trying to think of some of the old party strategies. Um, hang out with one person. Find the one, this is my person, and then I'd hang out with them for the whole night. And then ironically, at the same time, be like, this is wrong. I should be going and talking to other people. That was a good game. Um, superficial ping pong or pinball rather. So I'd bounce between people and kind of show up and say a few jokes and then leave before people got tired of me. I was often doing that and probably before I got tired of them. So I'd like swoop in and do something hilarious and then swoop out to go to the next person without any ability to get to like a level of depth. Um, all of these, all great strategies. Very, very, I was very good at like networking in the, the way we don't like networking. You know, when we think of like, oh, I got to go networking. What we usually tend to think of with that word is like a bunch of superficial conversations where you glad hand people and then give them your business card. And then you move on to the next person. I was really good at that because it was really safe and I could make a good, funny first impression. And then I would leave before you got sick of me and go on to the next person. Now I'm really good at connecting and that's way more fun than networking. And now I can stay with people if, uh, if I feel called to stay with them rather than having to leave because I'm worried they'll get sick of me and I can stay with them longer than I might feel comfortable because I'm afraid I'll get sick of them and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's cool. Let's see anything else that we haven't talked about before we wind down. Oh, when your transformation meets the real world. Well, I think I talked about that. That was talking about family members, what you brought, Alexandra. Balancing rest versus productivity. Well, we belted that one out of the park. Being with something versus choosing not to be with something. Nailed that one. Uh, I think that's everything. Uh, I'm going to go in an hour. I'm doing a breath work uh, practice. So for two hours, uh, someone is leading me through some breath work, which will be cool. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing because 
um, people are very generous and often want to provide me something. And I remember being in this place myself, which was uh, um, early on, I read like, oh, serve people, serve people. The path is serving people, which it is. It, it, serving people is what this what makes life amazing, I believe, and have experienced. And it's how we create prosperity as coaches and entrepreneurs and really whatever we're doing. And so in the early days, I'd like reach out to people like Michael Neal or Steve Chandler and be like, how can I serve you? Which is, you know, it'd be like if I reached out to uh, Obama and I was like, hey, man, you're rad. How can I serve you? It's just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know anything about you. I, I'm I'm already doing all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Like, so that's the first thing that that I would do. And then the second thing is I would I would want to serve people so as to bring myself up to their level. So I would I would want to connect with someone like say Steve Chandler and then serve them because now we're there's reciprocity. Oh, I'd love some of what you have for me and I'm going to give some of that back to you and that allows me to not have to be with the vulnerability that someone has something to provide me that I want and that might require some humility on my part or it might require some vulnerability to just receive or to ask for it or anything like that. So I still get uh, I get plenty of people doing that which is really cool because it's a sign that like, you know, I'm having an impact in the world and people are wanting, they're relating to me the way I once related to some of those people. And um, for the most part, I'm often a, a loving, no, an open-hearted no thank you to that with a willingness to explain where I'm looking, if that's the case. Um, and sometimes people reach out and are like, hey, I'd really like to offer you this. And I, and it's so cool to get. So, um, one person I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, her art, who lives here in Victoria um, and follows along with my content sometimes, I was just admiring her art and saying, oh, I, lo I love your art. I'd love to have a piece in my office. And she was like, oh, I'd love to create that for you. And so that's like a beautiful thing getting created. And um, someone reached out to me recently and was like, hey, uh, I've heard you talk about breath work and I just feel called to offer you something. And I said, cool, let's do it. And when she asked, um, why I said yes, I said, well, I love, I do love breath work. I think it's really potent and your offer felt heartfelt. And so I thought, yeah, let's do it. And uh, she teared up a bit and said, yeah, it really was. So we'll do that for a couple hours and then we'll be off to the weekend. Y'all are awesome. Big thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, thanks, I wanna give a big thanks to Andrew, Alexandra, Hannah, Jess, um, anyone else that I'm forget, oh, Bob for your jokes, for, uh, for submitting uh, um, topics. It, it's, it's so nice to not have to generate all of it, you know, to get to co-create with you guys is such a treat. And I really think this is what life's about is to get to be in partnership with each other and to co-create. So have an amazing weekend. Love you all. Bye for now.